This is Greg Troutwine with Maritime Reporter TV, and we're very pleased to be joined again by Philip Lewis, the Director of Research for World Energy Reports, to discuss the fast-evolving offshore wind business in the United States. Is this really the year when offshore wind activity is going to take off in the United States? Oh, hi, Greg. Yeah, thanks for having us back. Um, well, yeah, after several false starts, um, 2021, we think is the year that the offshore wind industry begins to realize its potential. At World Energy Reports, we're just releasing our intelligence pack uh, that represents a roadmap to the opportunities. So there are at least 30 major offshore wind projects that are forecast to be developed within this decade. So ports, fabricators, component manufacturers, vessel operators, uh, shipbuilders, engineering firms, and lenders, that will benefit from close to $88 billion of CapEx and a $2.8 billion annual OPEX opportunity. Now, despite being the second largest global market for onshore wind, the United States is today a minor player in the offshore wind industry in comparison to the European and Asian offshore wind markets. Two operational projects for a total 42 uh, megawatts of installed capacity were installed in the US at the end of 2020. Now that's put in the context of a global installed generation base of close to 34 gigawatts. So obviously the US is starting from a relatively small base, but 2021 will deliver a step change in that activity and in the US as, it, as the US begins its journey to accelerate, on that journey accelerates to develop the 27.6 gigawatt project pipeline within this decade. So, Phil, obviously, uh, there is potential. There are opportunities out there. Uh, there is money that is being spent. Where specifically do you see the opportunities? OK, so I think the first thing to say is that the US is home to a large offshore wind potential. In fact, 29 states have commercially feasible wind resource. In theory, if all the US commercially feasible offshore wind resource were to be developed, it would result in a power generation capacity of double the total US electricity production capacity today. As I say, that's theoretical. We don't see it all being developed. But what we're saying is in all the states, all those coastal states and the Great Lakes states, there's wind potential. So the first movers for commercial scale offshore wind projects will be the Northeast and Middle Atlantic states. These regions will account for most of the construction activity within this decade. Uh, we're also forecasting a demonstration project in the Great Lakes. Uh, next to move will be the Pacific states where wind area leasing process um, could kick off as early as the end of this year. Um, there's a potential that large projects could be brought on stream in the Pacific by the end of this decade at, at the earliest, uh, but it's more likely that this market will provide good opportunity into the next decade. And finally, some Gulf of Mexico and South Atlantic states will begin to advance their offshore wind ambitions within this decade. Obviously, many of our discussions on this market uh, are on the pace and the direction. Um, but let's kind of flip that a little bit and let's look at who. Who will make this happen? Who will be investing to turn this into this potential into reality? Okay, there are... Um... There are three key players who will make offshore wind a reality in the US. Um, you've got the federal government, the states and developers. So the federal government, they promote and regulate offshore wind. The states enact policies that drive demand. Uh, until now, almost 32 megawatts, sorry, 32 gigawatts of targets and procurements have been identified. That's pretty much the same amount of capacity of offshore wind installed globally today. Developers are moving 30 major projects forward for around 28 gigawatts. This represents an 88 billion capex opportunity and an annual, as we said, annual recurring uh, OPEX spend of almost 2.8 billion once these projects are delivered. So, but when you look at the capex for this US offshore wind is industry, uh, how do you see it being spent? Okay, that, that's a good question. Um, now, 
the intelligence pack that we're just bringing out at the moment in that in that we we split the 30 projects into what we're calling short mid and longer term groupings uh, of, of projects that are going to be advanced within this decade and we've undertaken a bottom up costing um, exercise to identify where the money will be spent so in an offshore wind project uh, in, in the united states the initial stage is where the developer assesses the site and makes the project construction ready now Apart from engineering and permitting activities, this stage involves a number of survey activities calling on geophysical, geotechnical, ocean survey and offshore logistics vessels. As an example, one of the large short term projects has charted in over 20 Jones Act compliant vessels and several uh, foreign flag vessels to support its survey campaigns. Around $60 billion will be spent on material supply, manufacturing and fabrication services. In our report, we review individual developer and project supply chain strategies to identify where the opportunities are. And this is both for US and overseas suppliers. Now, we forecast the offshore construction and commissioning will account for around $25 billion. Now, we review the opportunities for both Jones Act and foreign flag vessels to support these activities. We see over 20 different vessel uh, types being used in the offshore wind construction. Our analysis indicates tight supply of key assets. Uh, so not all the assets, but then some of the key assets for the construction side, there is definitely going to be tight supply. And that can lead to project delays in and cost overruns unless new tonnage is made available. To develop all of this capacity, uh, that will require a large number of suitable, uh, large um, marshalling, manufacturing and construction support ports. In our report, we review nearly 50 ports identified for these activities, including investment requirements to make the ports um, offshore wind ready. And that's a great opportunity. As you discussed, once the projects are delivered, uh, you mentioned about $2.8 billion in annual OPEX expenditures. Um, what specifically will this be spent on? Oh, that's a good question. Um, as with the offshore oil and gas projects uh, that we have some like the Gulf of Mexico, a significant amount of lifetime project cost in an offshore wind farm is represented by routine planned operations and maintenance. For an offshore wind farm, this is typically 40 to 45% of the lifetime cost. So it's a significant amount of the total uh, lifetime cost of an offshore wind farm. Now wind farm uh, operators will set, will set routine inspection and maintenance schedules, chartering long-term vessel support for the activities. The tonnage will most likely be Jones Act vessels. Our report looks at what needs to be built, such as the crew transfer vessels, or CTV, and service operation vessels, or SOV. We also look at what can be redeployed and modified from the existing Jones Act fleet. There are certainly some interesting opportunities for vessel owners, operators, shipbuilders, and marine equipment suppliers. We understand that you will be participating in a webinar on March 25th to further discuss the findings of your latest report. I know we've already covered a lot of ground here, but can you give us an overview or some insights on what our viewers can expect to find when they log in on March 25th? Yeah, well, I'm certainly looking forward to the webinar on the 25th, Greg, um, and we'll be joining Equinor, ABB and Lloyd's Register in discussing the opportunities that the US offshore wind market represents. There's certainly a lot of excitement about US offshore wind and at World Energy Reports, we're providing ports, fabricators, component manufacturers, vessel operators, shipbuilders, engineering firms and lenders with a roadmap to understand how they can benefit from these opportunities. How can they um, take part in that $87.5 billion CapEx opportunity and $2.8 billion of annual OPEX opportunity?